Well, our guest needs no introduction. He was our North Star uh, during COVID uh, from its discovery to uh, scientific guidance on how to avoid it. And there with us during the vaccine development, it really put an end to the pandemic. Unfortunately, what we're experiencing today in our country is that diversity has become divisiveness. Yeah. And that is something that I would hope when you look back at PEPFAR and see what can be done when people of diverse ideologies work together in yeah. a bipartisan way, you can do something that is historic in its impact. As you mentioned, 25 million lives saved over 20 years. That would not have happened if there was a degree of divisiveness, the likes of which we're seeing today. Dr. Anthony Fauci has had a long, and it is an understatement to say, <laughs> distinguished career in medicine, uh, in service, in government service. We are so delighted to welcome him here today. We first knew Dr. Fauci because of his work in HIV in the 1980s, and then of course followed his worldwide work with PEPFAR, and most recently over these past several very challenging years, his leadership and guidance in COVID was truly a gift to the country. We only have less than 20% of the people in the country have taken that bivalent booster. That's not good yeah. if you really want to get a degree of immunity that you can lift up. So what we're hoping is that as we get to this fall, which is a year later from the original BA4-5, that if we can approach a 50% uptake, I think we'll be in really good shape. Thank you for being here, Dr. Fauci. Thank you, good to be with yeah, you. Yeah, and welcome to Conversations in Healthcare in person. Yes, indeed. So, and we just want to remind our audience, this is not a green screen. <laughs> uh, this is real. Uh, we might travel out there after to, to show people. But you know, we're here to talk to you about uh, PEPFAR. Right. Because it's its 20th anniversary. Right. And uh, really, I don't think the American public knows the magnitude of this impact, $100 billion plus spent 25 million lives saved. Uh, but it's just, it's been so consequential. Right. And you were our main architect for that. And I'm wondering if you could just take us back yeah. 20 years ago and maybe tell a little bit about the, the, the story. Well, actually really it emanated from the fact that back in the mid 90s, 1996, when after several years of incremental improvements in the treatment of persons with HIV, in 1996 was really a, a transitional year yeah. where with a drug called protease inhibitors put in a combination of three, literally transformed the lives of persons with HIV in the United States and in the developed world that had accessibility to therapy. So that people who had an inevitable death sentence actually were coming out of hospice, were Incredible. getting jobs, were looking forward to what would be almost a normal lifespan. And that took place and got better and better with better drugs and less toxic drugs from 1996 to about 2000, 2001. What became obvious to some of us, myself included, but also importantly to President George W. Bush, yeah. was that we were essentially transforming the lives of individuals and in other parts of the world, particularly Southern Africa and the Caribbean and other regions that didn't have accessibility to these life-saving drugs, people were dying uh, in, in, like 95% yeah. mortality. And the president tasked me, uh, literally came in and called me to his office in the, in, in the White House, to the Oval Office, and said, we've really got to do something about this. I want you to go to Africa and I want you to determine the feasibility mm -hmm of doing something that's transformative and accountable uh, because, and these were his exact words, that he felt that we as a rich nation have a moral responsibility yeah. with all of our resources to not allow people in a different part of the world to die from a treatable disease just because of where they happen to be mm. living mm. and where they were born. And he sent me there to put together a program. Was it fee? We didn't realize or know there were many people that were very skeptical. How can you get drugs and prevention in a developing region of the world 
where you have to take multiple pills multiple times per yeah. day. And that was, I think, an assumption that was ill-founded in reality. Yeah. <laughs> because when I went there and I saw what would, could be done, that's when I came back and presented it to the president that I think we can do this with this program. And he said, well, go ahead and put it together and I promise you I'll support it. And I remember telling him, but that's gonna cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And his words were, let me worry about the money. Yeah. Just put together the program. So it really shows how leadership from above, from somebody who's, who was a compassionate conservative, essentially gave me and others the, the task to go ahead and do something that has literally transformed the lives of part of the continent of Africa. You know, just uh, speaking about the President Bush, uh, we have an experience, as you know, for the last 50 years, we've been providing health care to people who live in poverty. And it was George Bush who came in and said, let's double the amount of community health centers there are in this country. Right. Sort of came out of the blue, yeah. but really came out of this deep compassion. Talk about conservative uh, Americans like the president who really connected the dots and said this was yeah. important. Well, yeah, it was the president himself, the people around him, yeah. people who very few people have heard of that just made things happen. Yeah. People like Josh Bolton, who was the deputy chief of staff at the time, and Gary Etson and Margaret Spelling, and people like that who helped me have the access to essentially, literally open access right. to the president, which is a very unusual thing <laughs> that someone could happen. And all along the way, we kept on fine tuning it and fine tuning it. But the important issue that I think you're alluding to is that you know the 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 diversity in our country of political ideology yeah. of conservative center right center center left progressive liberal is very healthy because we have a diverse country right. and if those groups as different as they are ideologically work together in a common cause amazing things can happen unfortunately what we're experiencing today in our country is that diversity has become divisiveness. Yeah. And that is something that I would hope when you look back at PEPFAR and see what can be done when people of diverse ideologies work together in yeah. a bipartisan way, you can do something that is historic in its impact. As you mentioned, 25 million lives saved over 20 years. That would not have happened if there was a degree of divisiveness, the likes of which we're seeing today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Fauci, this is a story that I think needs to be told over and over. We're so glad to have you here to tell that story. You very justly earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, for your leadership on PEPFAR, which I think is uh, in the category of few things, few people accomplish that in right. the United States. And so congratulations Thank always you. for that. But when we look forward now, what is your sense of two things, the continued commitment to PEPFAR, because right. as you say, so much progress has been made, but we don't have a vaccine, we don't uh, have a cure. So what's that commitment? And when you look at the infrastructure that's developed in Africa, uh, in the areas that you focused PEPFAR on, what do you see uh, being sustained from the effort that you began so many years yeah. ago? Great question. I think people should be aware that although this started in the Bush administration, which was a conservative, compassionate, conservative Republican administration, that was 20 years ago. Right. And we've had multiple administrations since then. We've had multiple turnover of leadership in the Senate and in the House over that 20 year period. And the support and commitment for PEPFAR has been maintained and sustained. That really is very, very important that this country realizes with our leaders how important that, that uh, particular initiative is. And I hope, and I think it's gonna happen, that we'll have the sustained, continued commitment. It's one of the best things that this country has done, yeah. maybe the best thing that we've done in the arena of health. You know, the largest program against any single disease in, in history and it's already the results are extraordinary. So direct answer to your question is that it has been sustained with a lot of good support. And I would hope that that would be maintained. The other part of your question is also important. It wasn't just saving lives by treating and preventing HIV, 
but it established in multiple countries an infrastructure that has been leveraged to address other diseases. And if you look at the PEPFAR infrastructure that has been built, it has had a positive impact on vaccinations for things like measles, on maternal child health, on women's diseases like cervical cancer. HPV. I mean, yeah. a- absolutely. Uh, President and Laura Bush made it another additional add-on program to PEPFAR hmm. to address another completely mm-hmm. preventable disease. Uh, so it's had multiple spin-offs that aren't just about HIV. So that really is an interesting model. And in fact, some of the care and delivery of vaccinations in Southern Africa for COVID leveraged the PEPFAR infrastructure to do that. So it has had impact well beyond HIV. Great, and I would, I would say not only the treatment, but the whole chain of outreach, engagement, addressing social service needs, what gave rise to the Ryan White right. legislation, always attend to the social needs as well as the medical needs if you want to make a difference, really began with that initiative. It did, it did. You know, I was thinking about the force multiplier, even though it's a small amount of money uh, over a a very large budget. You know, we're here at the Aspen Institute's uh, Ideas in Health uh, Gathering, and we had this opportunity to sit around with uh, Secretary Azar, former Secretary Azar, Secretary Sibelius, and uh, the current Secretary uh, uh, Becerra. And they were sort of saying, what what are, what's sort of one of these values of, uh, of uh, the work that they do at HHS. He said the impact on us in terms of a global leadership. Right. Uh, when a lot of times people aren't welcoming Americans in, they're embracing when NIH comes in, right. that it has such a profound impact uh, around the globe in terms of our sta- status. And so it's, it sounds like a lot of money, but against our budget, uh, it's sort of a, very small percentage. It's a fraction of a percent, our global yeah. health initiatives. Right. A but fraction. Talk, talk about that, because you yeah. have been one of the, 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 the uh, captains of, of that <laughs> uh, uh, engagement with countries all over the globe about how they embrace Americans, how they look at Americans right. in a different way. Yeah, I think if the rest of the country was fully appreciative of what a program like PEPFAR and to some extent, the president's malaria initiative also. Right. What that has done for how the rest of the lower and middle income country world right. looks at Americans. Throughout the world, we are often not the most popular people. I yeah. think that's pretty, pretty clear. When you go to Africa, uh, I've had experiences of people, just because I'm an American, not yeah. necessarily because I'm Tony Fauci, but because I'm an American, who come up to you and they look at you and say, oh, you're an American. You were the ones that brought PEPFAR, mm-hmm. that saved our village, or that saved my wife, or my children, yeah. or my parents. Yeah. It, it's, the, it's the best form of soft diplomacy you could ever imagine, uh, how people really, really appreciate. You know, China, can come and build their roads and their railroads and their highways, which is fine, you know, but when you save somebody's child from dying, they don't forget that. That's Mm -hmm. right. They don't forget that. Yeah. 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 We heard that message loud and clear yesterday, I think from some of our colleagues at CDC, talking about we have this enormous core of people all over the world that when they speak, people know they're speaking about caring for their families and their health. And that is a huge form of, as you say, soft diplomacy and a great gift. But when we uh, we have to ask, of course, with all that you did with PEPFAR, with HIV uh, in the United States before that, how did it prepare you to respond when COVID, something that perhaps you expected, but I think most of us never saw it coming. Yeah. When that came, how did all of those lessons and infrastructure lead you to be able to intervene in the ways that you did and to lead us through yeah. that? Well, the answer to the first part of your question is that for decades in my lecturing, people would always ask, what is your worst nightmare? Mm. And my answer on record, go back, check it out online. (laughs) We will. (laughs) (laughs) Has been the emergence of a brand new respiratory infection Uh that's highly transmissible with a high degree of morbidity and mortality 
that jump species from an animal reservoir mm -hmm. to a human. And unfortunately, the last three and a half years, yeah. we've been living my worst nightmare. So although we were felt to have been prepared, um, there were certain aspects of preparation that we did not do very well. I tend to try and explain it, and this gets to your second part of your question about what the work we did with HIV and the input we did in the investment in science that led to the early development of one drug, then two drug, then combinations of mm -hmm. drugs. The, the sustained commitment and investment in basic and biomedical research is something we should never forget. Mm -hmm. If you look at COVID, you can divide preparedness and response into two major buckets. One is the scientific bucket and the other is the public health bucket. The scientific response and preparation was a resounding success. Yes. If you look at the fact that the virus was recognized with the sequence put in a public database on January 9th, literally a few days later, because of preparation we had done for decades before with platform technology, with the mRNA vaccine, with imaging design, with structure-based vaccine design, we began the development of a vaccine within days. Within 65 days, we had a phase one trial. Within 120 days, we had a phase two trial. And at the end of 11 months, right. we had a highly effective and safe vaccine going into the arms of individuals, which without hyperbole is beyond <laughs> unprecedented. Absolutely. This would have taken several years. So the success of the scientific investment was clear. What we need to do better on was the public health preparedness. It was a di bit different from HIV because it's a respiratory mm -hmm. disease in which everybody in the world is vulnerable. Right. You know, it has nothing to do with your behavior. Right. <laughs> if you go into an elevator or a subway or in a room or a dinner, and then you could get infected. So it had that major difference. But the public health infrastructure throughout the world, and particularly in the United States, it shone a bright light on the inadequacy of the connection between the delivery of health care and the public health enterprise. I mean, the lack of availability of data in real time. Yeah. What is the prevalence of the infection? What is the variant that's out there? What is the resistance to it? What are the monoclonal antibodies doing? We were disconnected in this country. Uh, and that's because of the fractionation of the healthcare delivery system. So if ever there was a lesson learned about next time, we've got to do much better. And other countries, for example, the UK, some of the countries in the European Union, Israel, South Africa, where there was a firm connection yeah. between the delivery of health and the public health enterprise, they had a very good grasp in real time what was going on. We've got to do better than that. The other lesson learned is what we alluded to a little bit ago, is that if ever there was an inopportune time to have an outbreak of this proportion, historic proportion, is when we were going through a profound degree of divisiveness in our society mm, right. in an election year. Right. I mean, you couldn't make it up right, how, right. what a bad circumstance. And pathogens don't care <laughs> you know about I mean? politics. <laughs> it just, you know, we had a common enemy, which was the virus. And instead of coming together to fight the common enemy, we were fighting with each other. And that is a very bad recipe for a disaster. And we could have done much better. Yeah. You know, we saw that on the ground. Um, but we also saw some remarkable things. We, we happened to run a, a statewide health uh, program for, for uninsured. And the governor turned to us and said, will you run our four mass vac sites? Which is kind of interesting because we had never run a mass vac site. Seven days we set one up and ended up in a year seeing 830,000 people for vaccination and testing. Fantastic. But here's the good news is that we didn't know what we were doing but there were so many people who came out in America and certainly in our part of the world, retired physicians, retired nurses who came up and said, I wanna help. There's a great seam of, of, of opportunity for us to, to find, find things that bind us together. And I think when people were down and out, at the national level, there was all sorts of divisiveness going on. But I know you know of so many stories right. of where people came together 
uh, National Guard showed up, right. you know, just on their own. You had all of these. The fire department was there uh, across America. And I think we've got to get figure out how do we get back to that sort of common shared space yep. where values that are fundamental to a fair and just society are shared by more than that. What, what do you think the road back to trying to get yeah. to, because there were those moments, you witnessed them around yeah, the country. Yeah, of course. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think we just need to, you know, examine what we've been through. Uh, despite the divisiveness, I still think that we can reach out into the better angels yeah. in our society <laughs> and get people to put aside those kinds of, of differences, which, which really are, you know, antithetical to what you're talking about. Because right. The, the people in this country are, are good people. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. they want to do the right yeah. thing. And yeah. they have come from different backgrounds, and there's a lot of diversity. And, of you know, it, 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 it's an amazing country, you know, yeah. and we, we're very proud of it. It's diverse geographically. It's diverse economically. It's diverse racially and ethnically. Uh, it's, it's diverse in so many different ways. But coming together... Uh, you know, for a common purpose, there's nothing like the United States of America. Absolutely. So we've got to recapture that. A anywhere that you've seen that people are trying to build those alliances across lines, like you did uh, with President Bush and uh, others who were in the conservative movement came yeah. forward. A anything that you see that might yeah. give people a sense of hope? Yeah, I just look at what happened. I mean, right now there's this, you know, like I mentioned, this divisive at the far extreme right, you know, uh, that uh, just divided from the people on the other side. Remember, George W. Bush was a compassionate conservative and yeah. a Republican. So right yeah. now, this idea that the Republicans are way, way, way on this side and are very, very extreme, no. I mean, some of them are. Sure. But there are a lot of really, really fine Absolutely. people. <laughs> I yeah. mean, if you just go back and look at the people I dealt with in in the Republican Party when when uh, George W. Bush was president. I mean, we got a lot of things done. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, there are a lot of sustained changes uh, that have happened because of it. And I think one that we uh, maybe don't talk about enough is what happened within health care to take public health and primary care and bring them together much more strongly. The public health infrastructure in certainly in New England and I think in many parts of the country was not able to launch the kind of primary care response that we needed to see all of those patients, to counsel patients, to educate them, talk about why they needed the vaccine, care for them when they got sick, get them Paxlovid if they qualified for it. And I think we saw a renewed interest in the part of certainly our uh, clinical colleagues to be much more engaged in public health. Is that something that you've seen as well? Do you see yeah. much more of a, a, a joining of public health and primary care as a continuum? Absolutely, I see it and we have to do much more of it yeah. because that's the, really the solution to some of the issues that we're facing, absolutely. You know, the warp speed investment uh, that the government made right. was just incredible. Right. Uh, we were talking to the ARPA-H people uh, right. just who mm -hmm. seemed to have uh, uh, maybe the resources to uh, go out there and explore uh, and make the investments in that. Maybe talk a little bit yeah. about uh, both the ability that you had because you had the resources, uh, and then maybe a little bit about ARPA-H yeah. and how they may also benefit from okay. some of the lessons okay. learned. Okay, so two things, Operation Warp Speed. Um, an example of what amazing things can be done when you put an investment of resources in it with a good purpose and you have a good plan. So I mentioned the scientific uh, unprecedented accomplishment mm -hmm. of a vaccine that goes from a sequence in January to a vaccine in no, end of November. I mean, yeah. like unbelievable. Right. Which we gave on Christmas Day <laughs> yeah, right. in December exactly. of that year. So that's the scientific component. But there's an implementation component of that. Right. How do you get vaccines produced to be available at that 11-month period? Because the standard way of developing a vaccine is you develop it, takes months, a year. You do a phase one study, takes yeah. another year, a year and a half. You do a phase two study, takes another year, a year and a half. You do a phase three study. And you don't start manufacturing the vaccine at scale until you are certain that it works and that it's safe. The philosophy behind Operation Warp Speed is that we are going to take, the government is going to take the risk away from the company. Right. We're going to say, we have a vaccine that we think is going to work. 
start manufacturing hundreds of millions of doses now, wow. even though we don't know it works. Yeah. So at the time we were doing the phase one and the phase two trial, the companies were making the vaccine. If the vaccine did not work, we would have lost hundreds of millions of dollars. But if the vaccine did work, which it did, right. we, we saved years. And millions of and lives. Millions and of millions lives. of lives. Yeah. So that was the beauty of Operation Warp Speed. And a lot of credit really uh, is deserved by Alex Azar when he was the secretary right. of yeah. HHS right. and people at the FDA like Peter Marks Peter, and those yeah. people. Those were the ones that really conceived of and, and made that happen. We, my group, did the scientific part, but the actual implementation was done at, at uh, the level of, of, of a lot of people, but Alex and, and the FDA did a great job. When you talk about ARPA-H, ARPA-H really is a DARPA version of health. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it really is doing something that's a very high risk, but a very high reward. Yep. And that was the concept of getting an investment first of $1 billion and then $1.5 billion to put it into Operage to, to, to go after really high impact discoveries that if it doesn't look like it's working, then drop it, even though you lose money. Because that's yeah. how DARPA works. Yeah. DARPA, you either hit a home run, a double and a single is no good. That's right. Yeah, you hit a home run, that's <laughs> what they want. And this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But that's a different model, certainly than the healthcare. It worked on the defense right. side, but this right. is a, will this be a cultural challenge? I think within? so, I, but it's not gonna replace the standard no, no, way of absolutely. doing research. Yeah. I mean, the, the investment in the NIH, the long-term, years-long, decades-long investment is absolutely essential for getting the kind of advances that we've gotten over decades and decades. But that other twist to it, the upper H twist is just that added extra dimension. Yeah, I mean, it's very exciting, the sort of program managers acting as investment. Right. No different than a, a big hedge fund would say, hey, either give me a great delivery or you're out of here. Right. So it's going to be uh, important to walk, uh, watch early on in its, uh, in its uh, development. So we're, we're excited about it. We are. And we're also on this beautiful early day of summer thinking about fall and what comes next in this phase. We know in the primary care offices, people will be having conversations about RSV for their right. seniors. That's a conversation that's going to be had, but we're still gonna to need to have the conversation about COVID, right. COVID vaccines. And you know, from the days when we had six lines of traffic lined up to get their, uh, their uh, immunization against COVID, obviously that has waned terribly down. far down. But this fall seems like the opportune right. time to again, bring it up. The primary care offices have it, the public health departments have it. What, what do you think we're going to see with people this fall? Are they going to okay. accept that this is normal business yeah. going forward? Yeah, so what I think is going to happen is that you mentioned two separate things. So yeah. let's take one at a time. RSV has a really major scientific breakthrough of getting a really good vaccine against RSV. A vaccine not only for the elderly and for the young, but a vaccine that you would give to pregnant women mm -hmm. who would then give by transplacental right. passage of antibody to the newborn and protect them. RSV is a serious disease potentially, both for the very young as well as the elderly. So you're gonna see the incorporation into the vaccine profile RSV. I know I'm gonna get an RSV Good. vaccine at my age. <laughs> I can tell you that much. The other thing is how do we address COVID? Which right now, if you look at the prevailing uh, uh, a variant that's out there, it's a sublineage of Omicron. We had multiple variants from the wild type original Wuhan strain, mm -hmm. the first one of which in this country was the Washington strain, which is somebody who visited from Wuhan. Then you had alpha, beta, gamma, and then you had a big speak, a, a, a peak with delta. And then in Thanksgiving of 2021, I know because my Thanksgiving day was spent on the phone with South Africa, we had Omicron. And Omicron was a big, big difference from them. Uh, and ever since we had the first Omicron, we've had sublineages. We're now at an XBB 0 0.1, 0 0.16, okay? <laughs> so, so when we're going to be making the, the booster that we hope could be incorporated so that people will regularly get their flu shot and get their COVID shot, 
it's going to be an Omicron variant, which very likely will cover the circulating variants that we have right now. If you look at the uptake of flu vaccine on a countrywide basis, it's about 40 to 50 percent of uptake of all ages. If we could do that with COVID, that would be a huge success. Mm. So what we're hoping is that people who come in with the uptake of a flu vaccine would also come in and do at the same time, the same day, COVID. Because remember, we put out there in September of 2022, September, October, uh, September, August, the BA45 bivalent. The new vaccine is not going to be a bivalent. It's going to be a monovalent Omicron derivative. We only have less than 20% of the people in the country have taken that bivalent booster. That's not good Yeah. if you really want to get a degree of immunity that you can lift up. So what we're hoping is that as we get to this fall, which is a year later from the original BA4 or 5, that if we can approach a 50% uptake, I think we'll be in really good shape. Well, that's going to take a huge national campaign. We're just yeah. not, we're not hearing as much about that yet. I think yeah, maybe well, there's it, a reluctance it's, it's to June. push it up. I, I know. I, I, <laughs> From our point of view, yeah. that means flu season's right yeah, around the corner. Exactly. So I think as we get into July, right after the 4th yeah. of July, we got to start. That's when you start looking at the fall. Yeah. You're already into the summer. I think we need to beef up that campaign. You know, we were blessed to have you on the, the podcast uh, five times during the pandemic. But I remember the first time in f- mid-February you came on and there were a couple of things that you said that put the hair on the back of my neck on, on end. One was just as a reminder, uh, coronavirus is a mutating thing and it will continue to change. And the other thing you said, because we sort of asked, do you think it's here in America? And you just reminded us there were 20,000 Chinese a day who come to America by, by flight. And so two things, one, just we're gonna be living with something that's a mutation that we're not used to and having to deal with that. And we're, we're a spaceship, Earth. Yeah. We're connected. And um, we can't, go, maybe going back to the whole investments that we need to make, we need to have this relationship around the world. And I guess the question is around China, right. of how we can improve upon the communication that seems to be lacking that you had great relationships or the department had great relationships there because scientists believe in sort of having a global community work on it. So maybe sort of one reminding us this is going to be with us for a while, but also this interconnectedness that we have to be uh, keeping our eyes on. Yeah. The situation right now with the enmity that we have towards China is very counterproductive. The more we make accusations and the more we push against them, the more they pull back. And in order to be able to have the kind of broad global surveillance, global cooperation, global collaboration, you've got to have a relationship the way we had before COVID, which was a relationship of exchange of scientific information, supporting each other, and a lot of very good science has come out of China, uh, particularly in the field of infectious diseases, right. but other diseases. We've had collaborations with the Chinese for decades and decades. Now, if you ask somebody, it looks like this, we're at war with them, which is really very well, non-productive. And Se- Secretary Blinken was there meeting with yeah. Foreign Secretary Gang, and certainly the uh, issues about uh, where we can find common ground. They were talking about defense, which is very important, but it seems that healthcare uh, is important when uh, what, what's the status of independent conversations going on? Is it? Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. We've got to get away from the confrontative relationship. And, you know, it's it, it's both sides. I mean, the Chinese have been very uh, obtuse and very right. uh, secretive. And uh, are, they get very defensive when it comes to help. Even when they have nothing to hide, they act like they have something that's to right. hide. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a bad formula. <laughs> you know? uh, just thinking about does. the work, the seminal work you did in AIDS, how far we've come. Not a cure, but, but people are living uh, healthy and long lives. Not with only the long, but almost no, normal life expectancy, maybe yeah. a year or two less. Yeah. Is there any trajectory, you think, on COVID or is it not? Well, it's, it's a different, different type of... It's a totally different type of disease. We don't have a vaccine 
for HIV. So we can prevent by pre-exposure prophylaxis. Right. We have a lot of good prep. We used to have a pill a day. Now you have an injection you can give every two right. to six months. Right. Uh, so we can prevent disease. But for those who unfortunately get infected, the treatment is spectacularly good. I mean, I just... really, really, really good. That's totally different from COVID. COVID, we have a vaccine that works. Right. Now, it may not prevent you from getting initially infected because it's a very transmissible virus, but it is very good at preventing you from getting severe disease. So we have to combine vaccination with better antivirals because the people who get into trouble are not the young, healthy, 30-year-old man right. or woman who have no other underlying diseases. They get vaccinated, which they should, and kept up on their boosts. They get infected. It's likely they will have minimal symptomatology or maybe just a typical cold. Mm -hmm. When you have vulnerable people, the elderly, those with underlying conditions, those who are immune compromised, yeah. iatrogenically because of treatment of autoimmune disease or cancer, those are the ones that you have to have vaccine plus good antivirals. Right. We have a really good antiviral with Paxlovid. I mean, the, the efficacy of Paxlovid in preventing severe disease leading to death is very high, wow. you know, 85, 90% or more. But we need to do better. We need a whole, we need a whole pharmacy of, of antivirals for people. What, what's the work uh, like on long COVID uh, and what? Well, you know, it's still a somewhat of a perplexing problem yeah. that we don't really fully understand the pathogenesis of it. It's a real phenomenon. Uh, it varies in its severity from yeah. fatigue based on exercise to incapacity to be able to do something and a variety of other signs and symptoms, autonomic nervous system symptoms, unexplained tachycardia, temperature dysregulation, yeah. sleep disturbances, brain fog or inability to concentrate. It varies. I mean, for some people who have all of that and are really, really their lives have been really yeah. negatively impacted to those who get a degree of fatigue that lasts for four or five, six months and then gets better. Yeah. So it's a wide spectrum. The problem is we don't know what the underlying pathogenesis is. Is mm -hmm. that an, a triggering of an, of an aberrant immune response that you can't turn off? Yeah. Is it residual viral particles that are not replication competent, but are still there. We don't know what the answer to that mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci, you are so much on the edge of the sea <laughs> of science and clinical knowledge in such important areas. But I know you're also thinking uh, at this moment about the future writ large, who's gonna be this healthcare workforce, who are gonna be our public health, our scientists, experts. And I know you're very engaged with the next generation and generations yeah. behind that coming up. Tell us what you're doing, looking forward to doing to really stimulate that same obvious love and passion right. for the science and the humanitarian aspects of healthcare. Well, I asked myself a question after being the director of the Institute for 38 years and wow. being at the NIH for 54 years, over <laughs> half a century of that. What, what can I have to do to continue to make contributions to society in a different form than being a government employee? And I'm asking myself, do I want to do more experiments in the lab? Do I want to do more clinical trials? This is as important as they are. I've actually done that and I've trained hundreds of people mm -hmm. over the decades to do that very well now. So I'm asking myself, what can I do? And I, I say, well, what do I have to offer? With all of my experience, particularly the fact that I've had the privilege of advising seven presidents and I understand the global health and the public health system, that I could serve as an inspiration for younger individuals to get involved in science, to get involved in public health, and to get involved perhaps in public service. And I can do that by lecturing, by teaching, by writing, by doing what we're doing yeah. <laughs> right <you>. here. <laughs> um, that's really what I'm going to be doing with the, with the main theme of aiming what I say and do at the younger generation. Well, and that's so important. And, and the issue of diversity is so important. You've been at the forefront of that. Your work in AIDS, uh, PEPFAR for sure, uh, and the COVID uh, pandemic. We had the president of Morehouse on the other day, and he noted that when he got his degree, there were 3% uh, uh, black physicians, and 40 years, 50 years later, they're 5%. 
we really haven't made that type of progress no. in diversity. I know this is a big, important issue for you. Yeah. What What do you? What strategies can we employ? Uh, certainly, it's having mentors and teachers uh, who inspire people, but we right. just need to do better. You've got to train a younger generation of minorities, and you've got to give them the opportunity of mentorship because you begin a process that's self-fulfilling. Yeah. Because if you train a cadre of young people who could serve as role models for the next group, they will then train the next group. You've got to get the machine going. If you don't have enough people who are the, being the mentors for the other next generation, you're, you're not going to get beyond that 3 to 5%. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to cultivate getting individuals in a broad variety of yeah. diversity yeah. into the system. Yeah. Train them, give them the opportunity. And when you give them the opportunity, they're as good as anybody else. I mean, that's, that's, I that's mean, right. that the fact that they're not yeah. as nonsense, they are. And Margaret, I know we've been concerned about the data, the science data that uh, is out there around diverse populations in the All of Us program and how we've tried to mm -hmm. think about that. Certainly, in, in all of our research efforts, the goal is to bring in people who, as Francis Collins so brilliantly said, are like all of us, and that's right. been right. that's been a great success in that kind of research. We've talked to the ARPA folks about this as well, looking for research ideas and research, uh, not just from the usual players, our best academic institutions, but looking at community participatory research, reaching out into communities where diverse populations are represented is really huge. And I, I wanted to, uh, if, if we have time, uh, get in a question about the workforce. Again, I know you live in an interprofessional household. Yes. I had the opportunity. <laughs> I was at the American Academy of Nursing uh, ceremonies last year with you and your wife, I think, on Zoom uh, at that point, which was just wonderful, the comments from both. But again, in the long arc of progress that we like to see, how do you think we've done at really being much more inclusive around all the health professions and stimulating that collaborative work, that teamwork, whether it's in the hospital or public health, the science labs, what's your, what's your kind of future gaze? I think we've this? done a pretty good job. I mean, if you look at what things were like when I got into medicine, you know, I, I entered medical school in 1962 and I graduated in 1966, it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, the situation now has been much more inclusive and it, it really is better. Mm -hmm. You know, there were people who think that, you know, when, when you reach out to try and make it more inclusive, you're going to diminish the quality, mm -hmm. which is absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. That when it represents society, it is much, much better. Yeah. Yeah. And we see that here at the Aspen Institute, uh, the diversity of people who are here. I think it's trying to find places where we can talk together to each other. Right. Uh, and, and break bread. Tell us a little bit about your, are you, we asked you when we last met, maybe in December, if there's a book in your future. There or is, yeah. There, can tell us any, anything you want to announce? <laughs> it is an announcement. I'm, 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 ever since I stepped, I, even before I stepped down, I had been working on a memoir, which is part of the process of trying to inspire young people to talk about my history, you know, from the time I got into medicine and science and public health. And it's a long history, you know, it goes way, way back and it's been involved. I've been fortunate enough, as I mentioned, to have done this for multiple decades. Absolutely. I've advised seven presidents and the bookends of my career, interestingly, by circumstance alone is HIV in the beginning of my yeah. career yeah. and COVID, COVID at the end of my career. So I think there's a story there, which I'm working on in a, in a memoir. And when, when might we... Well, it because your publisher is probably asking you this. My other. publisher has not asked this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I want to get a, a full manuscript out by the end of the year to the publisher. Okay. And then it will take an additional four months or five months to actually get it processed. So I'm hoping, hoping that we get it out by the first half of 2024. Well, that's great. Well, it is a story that will be riveting to people. And it's a story that needs to be told. And on behalf of Conversations on Healthcare, on behalf of the country, we want to thank you for all of your service, all of your incredible work, and for being a guest on Conversations on Healthcare. Thank, thank you. you for joining us today at Aspen Ideas Health. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, Good that's to be great. With you. Good to see you yeah, again. Take care. Yeah, thank thanks you so, so much. much. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. 
The views expressed by guests are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of conversations on healthcare or its affiliated entities.